So I've met some cool and weird people through this hobby of mine and one of the coolest dudes is this guy I call my friend the recycler. I also call him Heisenberg because his basement kind of looks like, well, you know. I've met him some years ago through an auction site. Uh, he was actually the guy who sold me that Mac Pro I featured some months ago, as well as the iMac G4 I also did a video on. I have also gotten a bunch more components from him. Old motherboards, sound cards, video cards, old SSDs and hard drives, some weird peripherals, keyboards and so on. The reason he has all this stuff is because he takes all the electronics and recycles them for precious metals. And most of the stuff he gets is just scrap. But when he runs across something of interest, he sells it to enthusiasts like me. And we've grown to like each other, so every now and then I come to his place and we just sit around and rummage through old crap while having a beer. It's pretty much my definition of a good time. Sometimes I like to come in when he does the final stage, which is melting down the gold he got from processing all the gold-plated components he salvaged from the e-waste. Anyways, he generally knows what I'm into, so when he comes across an old Mac, he usually lets me know. So on one of my trips, he gave me this weird MacBook Air, which had this radioactively yellow vinyl wrap and seemed to have a busted up screen, but other than that I didn't know anything about the condition of this thing. I took it home and a couple of weeks later decided to play around with it and to see what kind of a condition it was in. Now I've seen Mac notebooks with stickers and even vinyl wrap on the top and the bottom, but I never had a fully wrapped laptop like this. It even had this vinyl on the trackpad and I don't know whether it's the tackiest thing or the coolest thing I've seen. Looking at the external condition of this thing, it was kind of sticky and the charging port was extremely dirty. Also, since this thing was wrapped all the way around, I couldn't get to the screws on the bottom cover, nor could I see the model number. These MacBook Airs from around 2011 to 2017 all looked pretty much the same on the outside, so it's kind of hard to tell just from the looks alone what model it is. I was certain I was going to have to get inside anyway, so I had to at least partially remove the sticker from the bottom cover so I could get to the screws and while I'm at it, look at the model number and the serial number. Looking it up, I could see that it was most likely the 2014 model, which, you know, in my opinion, is still a pretty dang usable computer just for basic productivity. So after opening it, I could see that all the components seemed to be in there, including the SSD, which wasn't actually very surprising because with the sticker intact, I could tell that nobody was in here. But one thing that immediately popped up was this red sticker. Most newer Apple products have some way of keeping track of liquid damage. These tiny stickers are located on various places within the inner shell of the computer and yeah, if they come into contact with water or some other liquid, they turn red, which tells the technician that this thing, for example, doesn't fall under warranty. However, just because they've turned red, that doesn't necessarily mean that this thing had water poured on it. I've seen these stickers turn red just from being stored in like a wet environment. Anyway, since I was going to be testing this thing, I wanted to clean the charging port. It's pretty much the first thing I do since a dirty MagSafe port might prevent the computer from receiving power. After doing that, I took my MagSafe charger, and this is actually the first generation, which I use with these little adapters, and they work really good. Upon plugging this thing in, the indicator light came on, which is a good sign. It went from green to orange, which actually meant that this thing was charging the battery. I've tried pushing the power button and... Nothing. <laughs> nothing happened. The fan didn't spin, there was no activity on the screen. Nothing. Now, this could entirely be because the keyboard is dead. In fact, over the years, I did run across a couple of these MacBook Airs that wouldn't post with a damaged keyboard, mostly due to the faulty connector, and I'm not going to go into too much detail on why that happens. In case you can't turn your computer on using the keyboard, most of these old MacBooks actually have a set of contacts on their motherboard you can jump. We usually call them like power on pads. I've looked up where those were located on this particular motherboard and I've tried powering on the computer using a little screwdriver and a pair of tweezers to short the pads, but unfortunately I got nothing. So it was time to disassemble this thing some more and to troubleshoot a bit deeper. And as I was removing the components, I was trying to power on the computer in case one of the components were faulty, like the battery the screen or one of the cables, like the lid sensor cable or something, because they could potentially cause this thing not to boot up. But unfortunately, the deeper I went, the more of those red dots kept popping up. So it looked like this thing was probably liquid damage to a high degree. 
Now the problem with liquid damage is that if the computer had water or something poured on it while it was turned on, it means that one or more components are more than likely shorted out. And sometimes it's very hard to tell which because, well, you'll see. But the other more serious thing is that unless the liquid was cleaned after the spill, which very rarely happens, usually people just throw these things out once they're cooked and they get a new computer, is that the liquid will continue to eat away at the traces and other components, sometimes rendering them completely irreparable. And upon removing the motherboard and turning it to the other side, the one that was facing the keyboard, I saw the extent of the damage. Yeah, that's not great. So I can tell you now with around 100% of certainty what happened here. Someone was typing along on his computer and he was having himself a nice drink. And judging by the sticky residue that was left behind, it wasn't water. I'm going to guess it was soda or beer. Let's say beer because I don't really drink soda. They've spilled the beer on the keyboard and lost their mind after the computer wouldn't work. So they've proceeded to channel their inner rage by snapping the stain in half, all without even removing the SSD or other components or even trying to clean out the schmoo left behind by their drink. Lo and behold, some months or years later, it ends up in my friend the recycler's pile of scrap laptops and I end up making a post-mortem video about it. Back to the reality, this really is pretty bad and the reason is because judging from the green death of this corrosion, it's been sitting here for a long time and it has affected a number of components. Just judging by the looks of them, there's some passive like resistors, maybe capacitors, but the worst thing is that big black rectangle, I mean big in comparison to those smaller suckers, yeah, that's what's known as an SMC chip or a system management controller. And that's a pretty freaking important component because it's responsible for controlling the thermals and the power management, battery charging, video mode switching, and all sorts of other things. So it being corroded and destroyed by this green death certainly isn't going to help this notebook work ever again. However, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Before driving any conclusions, let's just take a minute to clean the board with some isopropyl alcohol. First, I've used a brush dipped in alcohol to just break up this corrosion somewhat. And after that, I've gotten a larger bucket and I've placed the affected components inside. After pouring over them with alcohol, I have left them to sit in this bath overnight. I don't really expect this to fix anything necessarily, although you never know, I had some pretty good luck fixing things lately. But what it will do, it's going to clean all the problematic spots and also get rid of the corrosion. And that will help me see more clearly what's going on. So the next day I got all of the boards out of the solution, I've scrubbed them some more and left them out to dry a little bit, which I mean alcohol evaporates pretty quickly. I've proceeded to test the boards but again. But unfortunately there is no change. At this point, I've decided to try some replacement parts. Now, I don't have the exact same model, but I do have a couple of scrap spare MacBook Air stored away somewhere. <laughs> so after digging out one of them, I've taken the little power board off. Now, this model is the earlier one, and it's the smaller 11-inch model. But again, these MacBook Airs changed very little as far as the design goes. So they do share quite a few compatible components. So I wanted to try it out its power board. To be honest, this was probably redundant as it was showing that the power was getting through and indeed charging the battery. So I didn't think this would improve the situation in any way, but I still wanted to rule it out. After trying out the new board, yeah, there was no change. I've also tried my other working keyboard, but since these keyboards are not really removable, I mean, they are, but you have to break them off. I've just tested it in place. Kind of stupid, but hey, Unfortunately, it didn't work. And before anyone comments, yes, I've also tried doing all the resets, the SMC, the PRAM, and all the others. Afterwards, I got out my meter and I've started checking for some of the voltages. And I've managed to confirm that there were proper voltages at the 3.4 volt line. Also, I was kind of hoping for a broken fuse, but no, the fuse hasn't blown, which meant the reason for this computer being dead is that shit stain on the underside of the board, which the, yeah, of course it was. So I've taken the board up to my bench. Well, it's not really a bench, it's just my desk where I have more light. And I've decided to take a look at it in a bit more detail. Now you will see some close-up shots of this board and you might ask, hey man, that's a cool microscope. And I do have one of those cheap digital microscopes, although they kind of work, the base on them sucks 
And unless you get a higher end one, it's really hard to work underneath it. It's also kind of a pain in the ass to set up. So I thought, you know, this new iPhone I have supposedly has a pretty good macro mode. And if you had a phone with a macro lens, this might be nothing new to you. But I was absolutely mind blown by what I saw. You remember what that board looked like under normal conditions? You know how tiny those components looked? Well, this is what they look like under this macro lens. I mean, what the actual heck? This is just mind blowing as far as I'm concerned. To have a freaking microscope in your pocket that's also like a phone is just so convenient. And yeah, this is not in any way a proper substitute for those professional electronic repair microscopes you see repair shops use. But hey, in a pinch, are you freaking kidding me? There's no way you can work on these SMD motherboard components without a proper magnification. And if you have a phone with a good macro lens, I mean, it makes it a viable solution to troubleshooting these things at home. So anyway, I started looking at this board and what I've soon realized is that it had several components missing. The way I knew that is, well, just look at it. There are unpopulated solar pads around where the corrosion was, but also when working on these Apple motherboards, I always like to use this program called Open Board View. What it allows me to do is to open up these board view files, which are, well, motherboard schematics, but also much more than that. So this is our board. This is what we have been working with and I can hover around it and see every component. Now it's not very useful like this because we can see crap. So we'll just zoom in to the affected area and boom, this is it. This is what we've been looking at under the microscope or should I say the camera. And in particular, we focused on this bank of resistors. And looking at this, I can confirm that we definitely have a couple of them missing. We have a resistor missing here and also here, and I have no idea as to what the condition of these other ones is. But what's more alarming is the fact that due to that corrosion, we've actually lost one, well, at least one, solder pad. And solder pads are basically little exposed copper dots you solder to. But if it's damaged or missing, there's no way for the electrical connection to be established between the components. As for these other traces that have been exposed to corrosion, I've taken our little board viewer here and another awesome thing we can do is to just click on the component and it will tell you what is supposed to be connected to. So you can use your multimeter to check whether the trace has continuity. And the best I could tell, there were no breaks in the traces apart from that one missing solder pad. So what I did was I took my little X-Acto knife and I carefully scraped off some of the solder mask. That's the black stuff covering up all the traces traces so I could solder to it and this is how huge that blade looks when compared to the rest of the components. Now I gotta tell you something I'm no professional this is just something I do as a hobby so I mean there's really no point in you telling me what a shit job I did but if it makes you feel better go right ahead and if you've never tried doing work on these SMD surface mount devices I mean it's just so tedious and I really don't enjoy doing it. However, since I can definitely tell that there are components missing here, I mean, it's just something that I know for sure just looking at it, and I'm going to try patching this up. Now, I don't know the exact value of resistors that are supposed to be installed here, but these resistors are something that's known as passive components, meaning that they don't play an active role, they're not producing the electrical signal, they're just slightly modifying it before it's delivered to another active component. For that reason and also for their size and the fact that there are a bunch of them, they're often referred to as bird feed. What that means is that in many cases you can get by just fine without a capacitor or a resistor and it's definitely not ideal, I mean they're there for a reason, but the main issue of them missing is that the trace itself, the connection, is broken. So I'm going to attempt a dirty trick of just bridging these connections. I don't have a replacement resistor handy and like I said I don't really know the exact value and they're a pain in the ass to install so I'm just going to jump the connection using some fine magnet wire. Now what's funny is that this wire which I usually use for patching broken traces seems quite thin, it's almost like a hair but for this application it's almost too large. But I've proceeded to tin the leads, this wire is lacquer coated so before using it you have to get rid of the coating at the end and burning it off with a tip of your soldering iron usually does it. 
and I've painstakingly soldered it in, which was kind of hard to do while filming, but there's no way to really do this properly without magnification of some sort, and having that macro lens really, really helped me out a lot. People will also want to know why I didn't use my hot air station, and to be honest, it's so easy to desolder stuff that you don't need to with a hot air gun, especially when you have all the components that are so densely packed together. It's just so much easier, but not at all easy to just use a soldering iron, although it would help if the tip was a bit smaller and sharper. This brown schmoo is called flux and it helps the solder to flow and stick to things, but it does make it hard to see what you're doing. However, I've managed to do a pretty rough job, uh, but I did confirm that it bridged the contacts properly and that it wasn't shorting out anything it wasn't supposed to. After jumping both of these traces where the capacitors were, I've trimmed off the excess wire and cleaned the flux off the board using some alcohol. I didn't feel myself fixing both traces because it was kinda stressful. And since that was all the visible damage I could see, I've decided to try and test the board. I've hooked up the fan, the power board and the charger. The indicator light came on, which is a good sign, showing that the board was at least taking power. And upon trying to power it on, there was nothing. I've also tried plugging in the keyboard, the battery, the lit sensor cable and all the possible combinations, but it wouldn't come on. And before commenting, yes, I did try hooking it up to an external monitor just in case the fan was dead or something. But that was kind of pointless because I could tell there was no activity since the CPU wasn't even getting warm to the touch. And honestly, that's not a huge surprise given the state of this thing. It's more than likely that the entire SMC is fried, possibly with broken traces underneath it. There's also no telling how many more components and traces around it are shorted or broken. It's also very possible some of the other components related to the system management controller have been compromised, like the capacitors on the other side of the board. They also might have been shorted. And that's the thing with liquid damage. It's very hard to properly assess the damage, unless I guess you have professional tools on hand and a bunch of readily available spare parts you can throw at the board. And given the age and the overall state of this thing, it's certainly not worth my time. Even if I was to repair the motherboard, it would still likely need a new keyboard and probably a new screen. So you might ask, what the hell will I do with it now? What possible use could this have? Well, given how often I come across dead Max, I'm certain that I'll use this motherboard as a donor board in the future. The fan, heatsink, power board and many other components on it are still usable, not to mention all the other off-board components. The speakers, SSD, the wireless board, the battery, chassis, screws, cables, all these things are probably perfectly fine and still usable. And since these MacBook Airs from between around 2011 to 2017 share many of the same components, it's fairly likely I'll be able to use them in future projects. And I'm old enough now to know when to say enough. So I'm sorry if this video was kind of let down, but in my defense, I did call it a necropsy, a post-mortem of sorts. So yeah, that kind of hinted at the fact that this thing probably wasn't coming back from the dead. But its corpse might still come in super handy, and I do hope you at least enjoyed dissecting this thing with me. Perhaps you even learned a thing or two. And if you do enjoy taking crap apart and seeing what it looks like, I mean, hopefully this was at least entertaining. And if you did enjoy it, you might want to check out some of my other videos. I've done many more successful repairs on my channel, as well as overviews, retrospectives and other tech related subjects. So if you're into that, you might want to consider subscribing. I do these videos two times a week, every Monday and Friday. And you can also support me on Patreon for as little as one buck a month or more if you'd like. You get early access to my videos and you can also chat with me there. So again, thanks for watching and I'll see you again soon with something tech related. Cheers.